Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, if you could grab your coffees and and, and join us here. Um, my name is Carver Gillimpo. I'm the Vice President of International Strategies at the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, a think tank based in Washington, D.C. And it's really a pleasure to welcome you here. I know the Climate Week and uh, the High Level Week at the General Assembly is a busy time for everyone. So really appreciate our panel being here, but also you in the audience. And we have, uh, I'm told, over 200 people registered online. So uh, while... Um, uh, there's certainly more people online than in the room. Uh, I just wanted to tell you in terms of housekeeping briefly that the meeting will be recorded and that there will be uh, that recording available online afterwards just so that you're aware. I hope that that doesn't change the honesty and uh, the uh, the interventions that you're going to be making. Uh, if anything, uh, you'll reach a wider audience. So at CTS, we've been concentrating uh, that we've had a project on the global stock take for a number of years. And of course, COP28 delivered a significant outcome on that. But interestingly, also as part of the targets and signals was the uh, the urging of countries to deliver early warning systems for all by 2027. And that was particularly something close to my heart because I was a senior advisor in the Secretary General's climate team in 2019 for the Climate Action Summit when that was announced. So it's really nice to be part of trying to take that forward. Um, but also I'm pleasantly surprised that that topic seems to be gaining momentum. There have been events both in the margins of the high level uh, at the uh, General Assembly and other events such as ours. So it's really great to be here to speak about that. And I was just informed by my team that uh, that there's a hurricane Helena has just formed uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, normally these sort of events wouldn't we'd know about them days in, in advance this morning I didn't know about that and apparently it's hurtling its way towards the United States and will be traveling inland uh, towards Indiana um, so a very unusual path and if a country like this with all its resources is going to be facing those impacts you can imagine countries in the world that don't have the, those resources at an event I was at last week one of the statistics I heard was that the whole of the continent of Africa has fewer early warning stations than the country of Germany, so which is a pretty shocking statistic. So this is something we certainly uh, need to address, and it comes in a timely way. We have a fantastic panel with us, and I'm really pleased that they could join us. We have Cristina Rombaitis del Rio, who's a senior advisor uh, on adaptation and resilience at the UN Foundation. We have Thomas Asare the Assistant Secretary General at WMO, Kamal Kishori, the Assistant Secretary General and Special Representative of the Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction. We have Rebecca Manzu, I think prefers to be known as Becky, if that's correct, who's the head of the Zimbabwe National Meteorological Service. And my good friend since many years ago, Haja Nassim, Her Excellency, who's the former Minister of State for Climate Change for the Republic of the Maldives. So it's really a pleasure to welcome this panel. We will take some question and answers <clears throat> uh, towards the end. So if you have any questions in the room, please keep them in your head and we certainly encourage you. And also online for our audience, there will be the Q&A function will be activated. And just one final plug for those in, in the room, there's QR codes with, uh, with a link to our latest paper on early warning systems. Many of the agencies referenced here were involved in that paper it's a it's a, an excellent paper um because i didn't draft it my team did so i can say that um and online the there should be a link in the chat as well so please do have a look at that we'd really welcome your your thoughts and comments so i'd like to ask um christina to come to the podium and just give a short presentation uh, the rest of the panel will speak from the panel but i thought it might help for christina to sort of sit set the scene and kick things off by telling us where things stand uh, on the initiative uh, and what remains to be done. So you have the floor. Super. Thank you so much, Kaveh. And thank you, everyone who's joining for, for being here. Um, I'll provide a little bit of an overview of what early warnings for all is, just so that we start with a, a common base. Um, so the initiative, the early warning for all initiative, was launched by the Secretary General in, in March 2022. And, and perhaps this just reveals what a geek I am, but I remember where I was when I heard the news. Um, it, it really is, I think, the first truly continent global scale adaptation initiative um, because it is about providing early warnings for all. It aims to ensure universal protection um, from hydromet and climatological and related events. 
um, through multi-hazard early warning systems, anticipatory action, um, and other resilience efforts by the end of 2027. So it has a, a, a very big target <laughs> associated with it. And it, it really recognizes the fact that 50% of the world um, does not have adequate multi-hazard early warning systems. And 70% of all the deaths from climate-related disasters have occurred in um, the 46 poorest countries over the past 50 years. Um, but also on the positive side, recognizing the tremendous return on investment that early warning systems can provide. Under the Global Commission on Adaptation um, in the Adapt Now report, we found that, global, um, that early warning systems provide a 10 to 1 uh, return on investment, which, which is really quite significant. Um, this initiative, which, which shouldn't be conceptualized as a single project, it's, it's much bigger and broader than that. Um, really takes an end-to-end -end approach to the early warning value chain, um, trying to encompass the whole value chain, starting with dis disaster risk knowledge. So you have to understand your vulnerability context um, in order to make progress. Um, you also need the observation systems, the monitoring systems, the analysis, and the forecasting capability. A, a warning is no good if it's not communicated, so you need the communication and dissemination channels, and of course you need to be able to take the preparedness and response measures and anticipatory actions um, as, as a response. Um, there's been a high-level executive action plan um, that was prepared a couple of years ago. Um, responsibilities allocated to each of those four pillars um, within the UN system, and we'll be hearing from UNDRR, which uh, uh, anchors the first, first pillar. Um, in addition, there's been a um, common dashboard and monitoring and evaluation mechanism that's been prepared. You can all Google um, early warning for all dashboard and see the data yourselves. Um, it's really quite quite uh, impressive and, and easy to digest. Um, and then there's been formal linkages that have been made with the CRUISE initiative, um, which was established in 2015, um, which provides uh, which is a funding mechanism um, to to provide support for multi-hazard early warning systems in both SIDS and least developed countries. And there's also a former le linkage with the Systemic Observation Financing Facility, or SOF, um, which, as the name suggests, um, finances the, the observation systems. In addition, there's been an advisory board that's formed um, that has many corporates on, on board um, that are, are, are contributing services to the initiative. There's a friend group, friends group of donors to the initiative that has been formed and is coordinated by the Risk um, Informed Early Action Partnership, where they provide the, the secretariat services. Um, and there's been a good amount of, of political support that's been mobilized. As, as Kave mentioned, it appears as a recommendation in the global stock take that was agreed um, at COP28 last year. It also appears as a target in the UAE framework for global climate resilience related to the global goal on adaptation. And I must say this was the only target that I think everyone could agree to. Um, and I've, I've, I've never seen that much level of agreement in, in some of those negotiations. And I think really opened the door for other targets to get approved using the same for all formulation and univer universality. Um, it appears in various G7 uh, resolutions and even in the Pact for the Future just agreed a few days ago. It has uh, a couple of calls to action regarding early warnings for all. Um, but, you know, so there is good progress being made. There's a, a, a list of 30 sort of first rollout countries um, that were prioritized um, a, a little over a year ago. Um, and work is progressing apace. A um, there's some countries that are, there's less progress being made, um, places like Sudan, which, which has a lot of difficulties for um, working there. But it really needs to come together on the ground with the financing, with the knowledge, with um, the institutional arrangements, as well as the political will to, to really move forward. And I think I'll, I'll leave that for the other panelists to give us those examples from the ground where, where it is or isn't coming together in, in that perfect synchrony that we want to see. But just to, just to provide an overview and, and really highlight the, the high level of political support that there is for this initiative, which I have, have not seen in, in my 20 years of working on adaptation for any other 
um, uh, initiative. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Christina, for setting the scene. And I hadn't appreciated that apart from it being the right thing to do, that there's a, a return on investment of tenfold as well. So um, with that context, I'd like to turn to you, Thomas. I mean, I remember from my time in the SG's team, there was a a lot of push from the center to have a UN wide response to support this initiative. And having heard from Christina, do you think we're on track to delivering this initiative by 2027? What more do we need to do? And, and what's WMO doing to implement this initiative? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, that's a big question uh, in terms of whether we are on track. Uh, uh, and uh, without any definite evaluative process, I don't think I can make an absolute pronouncement on whether we're on track. But I can say that the significant progress has been made uh, and there are challenges uh, to that. Uh, and uh, and uh, we continue to work on it. And I think it's a... a multiple and you see the pillars in the early warning system and there are multiple uh, agencies and partners involved uh, in delivering this. So uh, sorry to say that uh, uh, some could be my personal view uh, in terms of where I sit and what I see uh, that uh, there's a lot more to be done, uh, uh, but not uh, absolutely answering to your question that uh, whether we are on track or not on track, uh, because that uh, is an uh, evolution question. Uh, tomorrow, the constraints could be removed and we could make significant progress and it wouldn't be an issue. But for now, I think I, I see a lot of issues really that we are confronted with. Yeah, so so for the uh, uh, the observation monitoring side of WMO, uh, been working, of course, with the uh, the MET and the ideological services, uh, but also to make sure that data is processed and, and actually uh, disseminated. And it's uh, through uh, making it uh, global, uh, although it's uh, bottom up. Uh, so, uh, that we've been uh, working with with the uh, the NMHS really uh, in doing that, uh, and of course the, the uh, it's not having the information for the sake of it. It has to be really a process in more uh, decision friendly uh, format, so so that it can help in the both the national adaptation and mitigation. Uh, uh, plans and decisions uh, that uh, made uh, WMO have done some capacity assessment, including strategic assessment of some of the uh, agencies, uh, the hydromet agencies and that it uh, work with for other the members of WMO. Uh, but we also partnering with uh, diverse uh, stakeholders for the private sector and the rest. But our role is to make sure that this partnership, because the private sector in particular, uh, tend to go with speed and with innovation. And what we are trying to do is to make sure that that is institutionalized, those innovations, because other than that, they can easily move on. And then there's a gap again. So if we don't institutionalize it, with the national system in terms of the MET agencies. And yeah, it's, it could be a problem when going forward because uh, I don't think that the ownership lies with them. They are helping, but we have to take that and institutionalize it. So that is an, an uh, uh, area that uh, we are working with. And of course, uh, WMO's own technical authority of making sure that uh, observation standards are followed and the rest are there. But no, all this that we are talking about, that's a big constraint and that is funding. I think uh, he talked about the systematic observation financing facility, uh, which really is supposed to put the, uh, the system in place with the capacity to really use the system uh, as well. Uh, unfortunately, uh, 
uh, I don't think it's seen much progress as we really have uh, expected in terms of the demand and even the priority countries uh, is not so personally, and this is not W movie. My personal view is always is this climate finance architecture really, the billions that we are talking about, where are they going? If we can make 30 countries meet global uh, basic observation network standards, then where are the billions really going? When we are talking about a few hundreds of million, a right, single digit, as opposed to the millions that we think we've made uh, available. I mean, Cruz is also supporting local capacity building and working with local system. It's, it's not, it's, uh, we do appreciate donors' contribution, but I don't think it matches the rhetorics. And I think we need to have uh, a frank discussion about that when we are really talking about climate finance. Other than that, uh, uh, I think uh, the early warning system itself will, will require early warning for itself. Uh, <laughs> so, so really, those are some of the realities that uh, we are confronted with. But that said, uh, we are working with all partners, and we will continue to work on the resource mobilization. We're trying to uh, think outside the box and see how we can collectively work together as partners. Um, my colleague on my left knows that we are thinking about ways of having uh, ways of getting resources, but that, that is what I can say. Thank you so much for that, Thomas. I, um, I, I sense the frustration there on the finance side, and uh, I'm glad you shared personal views. Just pretend nobody's watching and just share your... Um, so, I mean, I, I think from what Christina said, there's a clear return on investment and there is a frustration then that the money isn't flowing. And I'm, the, the other point that you raised, I think that's interesting, is about anchoring this, and it echoes also what Christina has said, in, in national plans and in communication so that... First of all, the warnings are communicated, but there's a system in place to act on them. And I do wonder whether we're going to see more countries put these in their national climate plans in the form of their NDCs, the National Determined Contributions that are due by the 10th of February, and also in their long-term low emission development strategies. So both on that um, finance aspect and the, the domestic side, I'm just sort of putting uh, Harjo in particular on notice because uh, you have that experience of the negotiation. So it might be... Uh, interesting when, when we get to you um, to if you could uh, pick up on that but I'd like to turn now to uh, Kamal um, from UNDR and of course Kamal you co-chair uh, the initiative with WMO and it would be interesting to hear from you what challenges UNDR has encountered in promoting this initiative and how they're being addressed and also in terms of the GST outcome the global stock outcome from COP28 are there ways that we can enhance cooperation to accelerate this uh, initiative? Uh, and um, what sort of what's your view on that? And how is you and DR helping with that? Thanks, Kamal. You asked about the challenges we are encountering, and it's only a, a one-hour event, so I'll I'll keep it to only three. Uh, the first is uh, that the initiative was described with four pillars of risk knowledge. Uh, observation, forecasting, warning, dissemination, and preparedness at the local level. But for all of this to work, you need uh, a very clear, effective, thought through, institutionalized, legally backed risk governance framework. And that risk governance framework, in a sense, is a reflection of national, subnational, and local level ownership of this. I think this is highly uneven across uh, countries. So I think that's a big challenge. It's a soft challenge, but it is the essence of everything. So you can install your Doppler radars, you can have the cell broadcast technology, you can uh, have great risk maps, and you can have community-based plans. But unless there's a clear risk governance framework which reflects a national ownership, which has some regular national budget behind it, this is not something which will sustain. Uh, your question was, are we on track on delivering the system? We may be able to deliver the system, but it is not about delivering a system. It is about sustaining a system. 
early warning system, like any system, it's, it's forever. It's a perpetual thing. Uh, for, if you do not practice these things, if you do not invest in it continually, if you do not continually enhance capacities, you know, test the system end to end, uh, when the time comes, you will find that it's, it's, it's not working. You know, for hazards that uh, occur with less frequency, such as tsunami, you can have the best early warning, but people forget, you know, so you need to sort of do it continuously. So I think in terms of national, subnational, local ownership, as reflected in a risk governance framework, I think we have uh, more work to do. The second is that uh, the in the public imagination, uh, a lot of uh, what we talk about early warning system is focused on direct life-saving outcomes. But actually, I think the application is much broader. We need to have a discussion with the power sector. How do you manage power grid when a cyclone or hurricane is approaching or extreme heat is occurring? How do you manage your railways? How do you manage your uh, shipping, aviation, agriculture? If you take a multi-sectorial approach to not just reducing the impact on in terms of loss of lives, but also loss of livelihoods, then I think the return on investment would be even more attractive. Uh, not just one is to 10, but perhaps even more. And the final one, I don't think it can be uh, repeated enough, is the issue of financing. Uh, so there is money going into uh, early warning system, but it's going into less than a, a dozen countries that have the capability to borrow uh, and invest in their early warning systems. And there, I think it is really important, particularly, I'll just pick one piece on investing in observational networks, for example. It is really important to recognize that if you do a better observation in Indian, Indian Ocean, it's a global public good. You're getting data which will improve your models. You know, land, ocean, atmosphere is connected on all time scales, all spatial scales. So, uh, so it's not like, you know, if there is a, a low developed, uh, least developed country where resources are not there to invest in observation, you're doing them a favor. You know, if you invest in observation network there, it improves early warning eventually everywhere. You know, I, is that right? Yeah. So, so I think that case we really need to make that, you know, it's really uh, it, to some extent the building blocks of early warning systems are global public goods. They are not just servicing some countries. So I think these are some cha challenges. What we expect from uh, the GST, I think there should be a clearer articulation of as as a key com component of our adaptive capacity, we should be able to talk very frankly about where we are with the current state of the uh, early warning systems. In that, I just want to add one point that um, there are new hazards that are occurring. There are cascading hazards that are occurring. There are hazards that are occurring in new geographies. And I think this, this work is something which will have to continue. And we always have, we are almost catching up to the emergence of new hazards. Just for example, glacier lake outburst floods. You know, these events used to occur once in five years in the Himalayas. Now there isn't a single year when we don't have at least four or five such events. And they and the number of lakes that are sort of vulnerable to glacier lake outbursts are not in dozens. They're not in hundreds. They're in thousands. So we need to install early warning systems there. And when I say install, it's not just at 3,500 meters or 4,500 meters. It's also the downstream communities. Many of them have never experienced this hazard in their lifetime or even in their grandparents' lifetime. So it's really important that, you know, we, you know, broaden the net in terms of the hazards we will cover. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think, I mean, you you reinforced the points that Thomas made about needing the sort of national level systems so that it's a sustainable system and not just an initiative that dies, but also the, the finance point, but also sort of outlining the scale of the challenge. But also, but on top of that, the fact that these systems can have a, a wider benefit beyond the very important of saving lives, but also to livelihoods as well. Uh, and I think those are all points that are well taken. Hopefully this is triggering some questions in the audience. Please do save them and online, do post them online so that we can involve you towards the end of the panel as well. I'd now like to turn to, to you, Becky. So you've 
it's a very different perspective in a way because you're very much on the front line of delivering this domestically in Zimbabwe. And I'd really like to hear from you how you are planning in Zimbabwe to take forward the initiative towards the user-driven early warning systems. And are there any lessons from your experience of implementing it domestically that might be relevant to other countries as well? Over to you. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to share the Zimbabwean story, which is also the story for the SADAC and for Africa in general. For us, we're exposed to early warning system, the need for it when in 2019, when tropical cyclone Idai hit us. 340 died, some people are still missing, and we find, found ourselves with um, 270,000 households affected. This was the first in our history. And being at the Met Department during that time, it came at a time when we didn't have any radars to track the storms. It came at a time when our equipment was very old. It came at a time when we had sh uh, staff shortages. So we were not equipped. And during the, the storm, electricity went. So it meant that we couldn't even go to TV and tell the people what was going on. This was a wake up call for the government of Zimbabwe. As a government, they then decided to invest in five radars, which cover the whole country. The last time we had radars was 40 years ago. And it also, as a government, decided that all our manned stations, there are 47 of them, should have automatic weather stations. Not only that, digital instruments as well, to get rid of the mercury-based equipment. It wasn't easy, but it was a sacrifice. So as a government, they decided this is the way that we are going. Funding for us, we knocked at so many doors, there was no funding. So the government decided this is our baby. We are going to take care of our of ourselves until the funding and the politics is worn off. So you'll find that I'm very candid when I talk of the funding because our government had to fund the med services from the fiscals. Having done that, so then in 2022, when the early warning for all initiative came, it was very easy to be embraced because uh, our neighbors had experienced this catastrophe as well. So we all knew we needed it. So now what, what is the plan for, to have this accessible user-driven um, early warning system? The first thing we did as Zimbabwe was to look at the national framework of water and uh, climate services. So we looked at those different sectors we had focal persons for energy, focal person for health, for DRR, for agriculture, and for tourism. So we chose six. So this helped us in our co-production of the focus for them to tell us exactly what it meant because this was a new area for us. Uh, focus based, um, uh, we, we were then, when we give a forecast, what does it mean? We had to do that after IDAI and when the early warning for all initiative started. Uh, the other plan that we had now was to establish dense observational network. We went to partners. In Zimbabwe, we need 350 automatic weather stations to cover the whole country. So far, we are at 100. And out of those 130 were provided by the government of Zimbabwe from the fiscals. We also need to increase our upper air stations we, we used to have 10, we only have one. Can you imagine when there's a cyclone and you want to profile, there's nothing. So this is where we are. So the plan is uh, in the budget for the Met Service this year is to increase, I think I, I, I bid for at least two or three uh, for next year. So it will be incremental because we've decided we cannot wait for funding. It might never come. And um, the, the, the 2027 is almost upon us. We also need to develop those point-specific products for our communities, site-specific forecasting, which means we are strengthening our numerical weather prediction. The SADAC has been uh, very helpful because they, they, there was a project that made sure that uh, most of the SATA countries had many high-performance computers in some capacity development. So that helps. So this is another way of, um, of funding funding 
if there are many of you. Um, we also then decided, once we got those riders, we thought, oh, we are okay. Little did we know that with the power cuts, we are not okay. Once the electricity goes, the rider has to heat up and then you might miss a lot. So all our five riders, they had uh, generators. It wasn't sustainable. So now we are, I, I'm sure the climate change guys are so happy. We are now working on solar power. We are going to tender for that. But if there's a donor, please let it come to Zimbabwe for the solar to, <laughs> to, to, to power all our radar systems and all the 47 stations because we need to have continuous power. And then much as we would want to have three-fifth automatic weather stations, this is not sustainable. So we have a research project, 3D. Um, we have this uh, uh, 3D printing automatic weather stations that are low cost. And we've decided that in the meantime, as we wait to have more of the automatic weather stations that we want, we give the, this to the communities, to the schools, so that they get used to using our weather and climate data and playing around with the data. And they may not send that data to, to us at the med station, but we, we intend to have their own database because this is something that we are doing as, as on our own as, as, as research within the med department. So that's the plan there. And um, so we are strengthening the collaboration in our research and we have discovered that one of our neighbors is doing the same project and they've already found a few problems. So we are collaborating with them to say, look, what is the problem? Is it the weather? How are they faring these 3D um, printed automatic weather stations? So that's progress. It's better to have something low cost than nothing at all. Before we used to use water bottles and we will, we will mark that this is 10 millimeters, this is, but now we are like, no, let's do the, the modern way. So this is the plan that we have. So I talked about the National Framework of um, for Water uh, and Climate Services. We hope to launch that soon. And then awareness and advocacy of the importance of med services was very, very low. So in a way, that was a blessing in disguise. Although it really was so devastating, we are still recovering from the wounds. So the the socioeconomic benefits of um, investing in meds uh, has been topical and our politicians are very interested. So that's a plus, that's the plan. And we plan to keep them going, to keep uh, them uh, informed about all our activities. Capacity development to enhance the weather and climate services value chains. This is very important because we have people moving so much. It's a high turnover of stuff. They go to greener pastures. Uh, I know that it's greener where you water it, but we are not watering it for them. So we find our experts who are highly qualified are going to greener pastures. So we are forever a capacity uh, pouring in funds for capacity development. And the WMO has been very good in that. So uh, that is the plan to keep on training them. We believe that wherever they are going, it will soon be saturated and we'll be able to keep them, hopefully. So the working with the SADAC region and the other, and the world at large is the plan. We, con we, we intend to continue working with them, even sending our experts so that they gain more experience. That's in our plan. The big one for us now is like we found ourselves with so much data for the first time in our history. We have data from the five riders, from those automatic weather stations, which give you, if you want 10 minutes at a time, whatever you choose. So we are like, what do we do? So we are, we are at a point where we are planning, there's a project with GCF for data integration, and we hope this will improve our forecasting so this is a big one for us. And then once that is done, then the communication. We cannot keep that information to ourselves. So communication is another big one. How do we communicate? How do we plan to communicate? We have all sorts of different people and uh, stakeholders. As I said, we are starting with the six sectors. We have the youth. The youth, they like this modern uh, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. 
So we are, we are providing that to keep them happy. And then the social politician, they are forever on their Twitter, which is now X, forever there. So we are invading their space. The elderly, they spend a lot of their time on TV watching their favorite uh, soap operas and um, and some of them enjoy their email. So we go to them that way. The remote areas, we now have community radios where people are taught whether, are told about whether in their own languages. This is so, so helpful because it was missing. We haven't done a lot, but I think maybe a quarter or a fifth of the country we have the community radios and we are very excited about that. We are also translating our, our focus into the 16 languages and we are going out to the people to disseminate that. The CAP, uh, this one is global. We, we, we have it in Zimbabwe. And then we also use WhatsApp, uh, radio, TV, and then the children, we encourage them to, ca to come for, for the tours and we are going out to them now for career guidance. We want to catch them young to tell them more about what happens in the MET department. Uh, so we have those uh, direct dissemination platforms and indirect ones in Zimbabwe with the community leaders. In Zimbabwe, we find that we have the provinces which go to districts and then to wards. There are 1,600 wards. Each one of them is a community leader who has a cell phone. So that has proven very helpful for us. We just send a message to him. He calls the people. They, they discuss whatever is happening, weather-wise, especially when we start uh, planting. Now, lessons learned. I'll, I'll rush quickly to the lessons learned. We are still learning. Learning never stops. So for us, we find that partnerships have improved, have, have taken us where we are. Some of the partnerships of friends of Zimbabwe, friends of Africa, uh, at times if we want things to move, we go as a, as a block, as a duck. So we talk to each other as PRs, we we apply for these projects and uh, we, we win some, we lose some. So part PPPs are very, very important. We have made sure that when someone wants to have a project with us, we have to be there from the beginning. Gone are the days when they come and they bring us some equipment which will only last as long as their project. So if you really want partnership with us, it has to be sustainable. It has to go all the way. If your project ends, we have to start incorporating it. So PPPs have been very important for us and working with other med stations. The political will is there in most of Africa. Uh, because after these disasters, the hydromet disasters, they realize that we have droughts, uh, we have floods, we have cyclones, uh, climate change is real. So political will is, is there, but we need to keep them informed. So once in a while, we tell our parliamentarians what is going on, and that has helped. So we are actively seeking funding and partnerships, awareness and advocacy of... Um, of the importance of weather and climate issues is something that uh, concerns us. Together we can, we cannot do it alone because, because um, hydromet uh, hazards, no, no weather. So this is where we are as Africa, I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Becky. Um, you actually uh, preempted my follow-up question, which was the lessons learned. So you, you answered that before I could ask the question. And what I took away from that was particularly the importance of partnerships to take things forward and uh, there was a very clear plea to donors in the room and also online uh, to come forward and help fund because as we've heard several times there's a really good return on investment to be made there and it's also just the right thing to do and it's a global good not just a local one so thank you very much for giving some illustration there of what it's like on the ground uh, in your country and in your region I'd like to move over to you, Haja. So your country, the Maldives, was the first country among 30 focus countries of the initiative to develop and endorse a national early warning for all roadmap at the presidential level. And I mean, with that sort of background and the particular vulnerability of the Maldives, I think it's one of five atoll nations in the world who are arguably the most vulnerable to climate change, you know, at risk of 
literally losing their entire physical t territory if we don't tackle this issue. So with that context and your experience, do you think that we're on track to deliver for the vulnerable countries? And also having heard some of the, the points, <clears throat> I wonder whether there's a connection to be made more clearly from what we've heard from uh, Thomas Kamal and also Becky to the negotiations. Could, could we encourage countries to anchor these initiatives in their NDCs, in their long-term plans, but also maybe really push the financing aspect for this as part of the outcome from COP29? So just a few easy things for you to answer there. Over to you. Thank, thank you, Kave, for having having me on the panel. And it's really an honor to be here with all the distinguished speakers. And I think you just mentioned the really the essential point and, and the connection of the UNFCCC climate negotiations and, and how the early warning for all initiative is connected. Because next we all know that next year, um, the NDCs are due on February, and we also have the national adaptation plans that are going to be due next year as well. And meanwhile, we are currently also in the process of negotiating um, and, and finalizing the indicators for the global goal on adaptation and figuring out the modalities of how to work with experts and parties to get to the indicators um, and, and have that be finalized in Belém next year. And so there, all these things are kind of happening in tandem and maybe it, it, it isn't as coordinated as it could be, but I think it's a critical moment where we could use the early warning for all initiative as one is a good example that can be demonstrated as useful for countries because a 24 hour warning could reduce damages by 30%. And that is a very significant thing to keep in mind, given that every year we're having more and more frequent and more intense storms and along with it more damages. And so countries with very limited fiscal capacity Ha that have um, have to divert their funds that they would otherwise use for education, for health, um, critical infrastructure to constantly deal with disasters. And that only pushes the, the country backwards in terms of resilience. And so I think, I think the early warning for all is something that if we could implement it nationally, it could give a good example to in terms of mobilizing even finance in in getting private sector invested uh, interested in 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 this as well and i think that what happens in terms of tangible good concrete outcomes nationally has the immense power to influence what's happens at the multilateral level and the reason why everyone should be interested in the early warning for all is for instance in a country like the maldives we depend entirely on tourism and the fisheries um, sector. And as you know, these are very, especially the tourism industry is is very, um, it's expensive investments. And the investors would actually care about what's going to happen to their investments, but also to the livelihoods. And it's, of course, connected with communities. And, and so there is a case to be driven here. Um, in another example of why the and I want to make the connection of the data um, and early warning systems. So, and and um, we, it one we it it has been highlighted that you know there in SIDS and LDCs we do not have enough systematic observations um, capacities, and that is something that's important both for the local. Um, weather systems, but also it's a global good for us to actually do predictions better. And the early warnings can only be good as the data that's fed into it. And therefore, it's really important that we have systematic observations and then we close the global basic observation network in, in these countries. And um, Kavi mentioned at the start of the panel that Germany has more um, stations than all of Africa. And that's really 
it, it really puts things in context. And this is why I think we should be focusing on investing on systematic observations and therefore early warning for all in also our positions in SIDS and LDCs at the negotiations and and also meanwhile it's something that's of interest to the the donor communities as well and that is actually the beginning without without this data countries cannot do their resilience um plans their climate plans very well so that is the first step so before you go into the different sectors you first need to have access to the data and that's going to be the other things will come after, in a sense. Um, so I think I, I I think that if we could invest in the systematic observations and early warning for alls, it would be a really good adaptation um, measure, but it will really also help reduce the losses and damages because with that, we improve our chances of by, by 30% already. So the case is very clear. What we need to do is also get get more, even more political buy-in. I think more ministers and more high-level people should be focused on on this topic, and and I think that the political will could really make a big difference on where the funding could go, and that and that could in turn translate into concrete action on the ground with more stakeholders, including the private sector. And that could create um, the, the, kind of, the kind of ecosystem that's required for this initiative to be successful. Thank you very much, Arjun. I think uh, that demonstrates why you were a minister and I, I never have been, because you really painted a, a picture that connects a lot of the things that are in play for this COP, for example. Um, so specifically, the the easy win of implementing early warning systems cannot help to break that cycle between impacts, increasing debt, the need for more finance. So it just seems like such an easy win for a relatively small amount of money. And of course, we also have the new loss and damage fund. We have the negotiations of the NCQG. So I think there's still, I think, was it 54 days until the COP for you to build political pressure? If anyone can do it, you can do it. Um, we have some questions coming in online. Uh, if, uh, if we don't have anyone in the room, I'm going to throw people I know in the audience under the bus and make them ask a question. So people should save them from that fate. Um, but before we take questions, I'd like to just go back to Christina, you sort of opened things up, um, painted the context, I wonder if you if there's anything that you've heard, that really struck you. And, you know, what can we do between the remaining time between now and, and COP29 to really push this? Yeah, first of all, everything I heard struck me. It was uh, so many important points made. Um, you know, I think the the point you just made, Haja, about the breaking the cycle of indebtedness is a really key one. I mean, debt is going to be a huge issue this year with the negotiations around the NCQG because and beyond, far beyond, because so many countries are, are facing um, extreme debt. So anything we can start to do now to to reduce that debt burden, um, prevent that debt burden, I think is 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 really important. Um, and then the point about really, this is the fundamental information we need to do our naps and our NDCs. Um, this is, I think, is is somewhat underappreciated within these these planning communities. Um, the other point that um, going from the local to the national, regional, and transnational level is a lot of, um, uh, uh, and Kamalji made this point uh, about the, 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 the cascading risks. And our systems, um, our frameworks, don't really capture those cascading risks and the transboundary nature of some climate events. Um, and so that's something that I think we need to, to put on the radar screen for, for future agreements, for um, further unpacking the global goal and adaptation and how do we bring in transboundary elements and cascading risks further into our frameworks. Um, so there's a lot to do. Um, it, it fundamentally does come down to unlocking the resources and building the political will that will do that. Um, there's a lot of competing interests and a lot of uh, different demands that are on 
funding agencies that are on ministers, ministers of finance at, at uh, in all places. And so the, the more that we can make the business case, um, the self-interest case, as well as the global public good case, I think the, the, the better um, that we are. Thanks, Christina. So I've got um, a few questions online here. I'm going to try to conflate some of those. And um, I can't hold more than about two or three questions in my head, so I won't read them all at once. But essentially, we've got a couple of questions here, one from Laurie, uh, Laurie Goering, uh, and also from another person online, saying that how much is extreme heat as a threat on as part of the um, as part of the early warning system, because there seems to be a lot of focus on storms and more visible threats. Is is heat something that's part of the early warning system? So that's something maybe the panel could think about. And also, we heard uh, about regional cooperation, and also just now, Christina mentioned transboundary. We have a question here: Are there any good practice of uh, examples of sharing cross-border information for early warning systems uh, purposes. So maybe we could pose those two questions. I don't know if anybody would like to take that. Would anyone like to take the heat question? Would you like to take that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, the whole initiative on early warning for all is a multi-hazard initiative. Uh, so yes, of course, uh, extreme heat is a, a part of it. Uh, however, I have to just uh, highlight one crucial dimension here. Uh, so an extreme heat uh, is not cyclone in the sense that um, you have a clear categorization on a scale, Saffir-Simpson scale of category one, two, three, four, five cyclones. Uh, heat and how it affects people uh, is very context specific. There is temperature, there is humidity, there is persistence over how many days, difference between daytime temperature and nighttime temperature, and the cultural context. So if you have 35 degrees in New York, uh, you would be saying that, oh, it's extreme heat. In Delhi, you would, New Delhi, you would say it's pleasant weather. Uh, because of uh, the way um, uh, different cultures are also building stock. So I think, um, so so for that, there is need to do uh, analytical work at the intersection of meteorology, uh, public health, uh, some infrastructure systems, and evolve locally specific extreme heat thresholds and use that to sound, you know, yellow, orange, red warning, so. Thank you so much for that, Kamal. So very clearly the, the multi-hatted is more than just uh, uh, cyclones and the sort of visible threats that we uh, hear about. Would anyone like to take the transboundary cooperation part of early warning systems? Does anyone have anything they'd like to say about that? Becky, Becky, you could take that. You could take the mic. Uh, whether uh, knows no boundaries, it's a cliche, but it's true. Uh, I remember with Freddie, the cyclone, uh, Freddie, the Australian, uh, the Australians were able to track it for us in Southern Africa. So they may be far, but I think it's one of those uh, sharing of information, although they are a bit far from us. But within ourselves, there are plans now to share our radar images because our for Zimbabwe, for example our radars are overlapping into our neighbors. So we'll have MOUs to share that information. And currently, our uh, South Africa is very good at sharing um, information with the rest of the SADAC region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Becky. And uh, you, I mean, you highlighted SADAC also in your first intervention. So that's really great to hear that kind of cooperation. Do we have any questions in the room? Because we're running up against time. If we have any questions, now is your... Please. So we have, we'll take two questions in the room and then there's this gentleman in the front after. Please, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, Olga Faktorovich Allen from App Global. Thank you for this timely conversation. I just wanna pick up a little bit on that heat stress comment uh, and bring it back to health a bit. So heat is the deadliest of climate hazards and we know that. Um, and I think what 19% of LMICs have a heat early warning system and the WMO 
produced a state of climate information for health report that was fantastic. I think it noted that only 14% of ministries of health have a collaborative relationship established with the Met um, uh, departments in country uh, to really kind of collaborate for user informed, tailored climate information services. Um, I wonder if the panel can talk a little bit more about kind of investment in that value chain and, and focused on the end user, especially as, you know, if you look at the health national adaptation plans, the second largest um, climate and health solution mentioned is actually for climate for early warning. And the first uh, most common uh, climate and health solution that's identified that's needed is a health, uh, excuse me, it's a climate uh, climate ready health workforce. So there's a really strong need for that capacity building and engagement with the end user, specifically in the health sector. Um, and of course, there's so much attention in climate and health financing right now. It's another opportunity to really advocate for increased finance in this space. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. We'll just have one last question here, Chelsea, uh, in the front. This gentleman here. Uh, hi, my name is Kalein Hussein for uh, Guardian Media, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so my question is related to the successes of the early warnings role. We heard a lot about the challenges um, with the program, and that has undoubtedly um, held up progress in areas. What are some of the countries that we've seen uh, progress being significantly made over the last two years? And just a quick addendum for uh, Kamal. Uh, you know, the Sendai framework, one of the indicators in there is having countries having an early multi hazard early warning system can't measure progress if we don't have the data for it so um has there been any review um outside of the midterm review for that specific indicator thank you for that question of course trinidad and tobago had that uh, terrible um storm uh, not that long ago um so would someone like to take the heat question first yeah please yeah i, I think the uh, we're talking about heat, but I think we need to talk about climate and health. And and WMO has a partnership with WHO on climate and health because it's not only heat, even flood can cause cholera and the rest and other phenomena can cause other mengoka diseases, so pneumonia, whatever. So the other deadly uh, health consequences and not just heat. But there's a broader cooperation between WMO and, and WHO. And part of this also initiative is to extend the knowledge to community health workers so they can work with the uh, affected population or the frontline uh, population. So that is an initiative also that will complement uh, climate impact on health. And, and WMO has a specialized agency on that also and the other uh partners that are uh providing funding and the rest and also technical uh, support uh, uh to that uh, as well thank you for that and i think as the question has said there seems to be increasing political momentum behind the intersection of climate and health i think at cop 28 we saw a particular focus on that and it's something that everybody cares about so it's a way uh, to tap into uh, into people. So please, Christina, yeah. If I could just add a, a, a little bit on that, the Secretary General put out a call to action this July on extreme heat and, and really raised the gauntlet on how can we, we rise to the occasion to respond to this issue, um, which I think was a, a really significant moment. Um, and in response, a coalition of philanthropies, I think, have pledged 50 million to work on extreme heat issues. I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, um, but, but that's an exciting announcement and more details are coming forward, um, I think, in the coming days on that. So stay tuned. I mean, I used to be a climate negotiator and you could get a kind of desensitized to some of the impacts. But I remember a few years ago, a front page of the New York Times showing images from Delhi of people lying on the streets with literally nowhere to shelter from the heat. And it was just shocking to see that. It's just almost unimaginable. Um, so it's, uh, it's an important issue. And then I think if I didn't misunderstand what, what have been some of the successes of the initiative and how do we collect information on that? So there are many successes, but his question was about challenges. So we just talked about challenges. Uh, I think if you live in a um, area that is uh, exposed to cyclones, uh, typhoons and 
hurricanes, the chances of dying now are a third of what they were 15 years ago. Uh, that's backed by data. Uh, you can also look at it event by event. Everyone talks about uh, hurricane burial uh, in the Caribbean, huge losses, uh, but loss of lives in single digits in uh, most countries. So that would not have been the case uh, 100 year, uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So rapid progress, you know, I, I compare that with, compare this with how things were in the world at the time of Hurricane Mitch in 1998. You know, it was a different world. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we've come a long way. And it's not just for storms. It also, it's also for floods. There's a thriving flash flood guidance program, uh, which is a, a flash flood guy, a flash flood warning is an extremely difficult thing to do, thing to do in, and we are getting some success on heat and health as well as early warning. Uh, things are very different from how they were 10 years ago. It's not just global policy frameworks. Uh, at the national, subnational level, so many cities are doing heat action plans. You can say that maybe they're not adequate. They need to be, you know, improved further, well-resourced, etc. But there is a lot of momentum right now. Thank you so much for that. I, I'm going to close here by really thanking our panel for taking their time uh, out of a really busy schedule. We've run up a little bit over time, but I think it was worth it just to take those questions. Also, very much to thank the audience in the room and also online. Uh, I, I think we should give our panel a round of applause and thank them. And then just a final advertisement. You can't leave this room without walking past 20... 30 QR codes. Please do scan them and read our paper. Philip will post the link again online. Uh, and the video of this event will be shared online. So please do share it and do speak to donors and fund Zimbabwe with its early warning system and others. Thank you so much to everybody. Thank you.